Hey everybody, um, welcome to the final homegrown class for 2020. Um, there's one more big topic that I want to cover, which is starting seeds indoors. Um, since your practice at the greenhouse, the spring got cut short. And then I'll just go over a few resources that might help you with your gardening in the future. So normally in the future, you should still be able to go to the high school greenhouse and start your seeds there with the adult horticulture program. Hopefully nothing will change and you'll still be able to use that um, for years to come in the springtime. But it is pretty easy to start seeds at home too. And I really do recommend that you start at least some of your own seeds instead of buying just transplants because it could save you a lot of money. Um, you get just the varieties that you want and it's pretty fun to get to start them from seeds. So the first step uh, to starting your own seeds is obviously getting the seeds. Um, of course, if you saved your own seeds last season or if you got them from a swap, that's taken care of. But otherwise, you'll need to buy them either from a retail company or directly from a seed company. I do recommend going directly to a seed company. Um, they tend to have higher quality seeds and a much better selection than some place like Walmart or Tractor Supply. Um, they are more likely to be more expensive, but it may be worthwhile to you to have to use few seed, fewer seeds and that sort of thing. Um, the Farm Bureau and Southern States and other farm stores also do have perfectly fine options if you would rather buy in person. Um, so I've listed here a few popular seed companies. Um, Johnny's and Seed Savers Exchange are the largest and they have lots of good um, growing information to go along with the seeds. But some of these other companies sometimes have better prices or more interesting varieties. And you can request their catalogs to look through or you can just check out their seeds online. And looking at how quickly everything sold out this past spring, um, I think you'll want to plan well in advance um, to get your seeds in um, get that order in as soon as possible, like before January, if you want to grow any really popular varieties because some things are selling out already. Um, as far as which seeds to start indoors, it's anything on your planting chart that says transplant instead of direct sow. So like cabbage, head lettuce, tomatoes, peppers. Um, there are some things that could be started either way, um, particularly the cucurbits, the squash and the melons. Um, if you start them indoors, you can try to get a head start in the spring when the soil is warm enough, but they don't especially like being disturbed and transplanting them may stress them out so much that they might not actually grow any faster than if they were direct sown. So if you're up for the challenge, definitely give it a shot, um, but it may not be worthwhile to start cucurbits indoors. Not all of your seeds should be started at the same time, um, so you'll need to make a plan for when to start which crop. Um, your seed packets will tell you when to start your seeds. For a lot of crops, it's about four to six weeks before you would want to plant them out in the garden. So just count backwards from when you want to plant each of your crops and then make a sowing schedule so that um, you know when to start each seed. If you're planting early spring brassicas, um, you might start sowing as early as January for planting in March. So uh, make sure you make this plan well in advance. Um, you'll need some space in your house for starting seeds. Um, it's not a lot in the beginning. Remember at the greenhouse, you all started with just one tray. Um, but at the end, you will have multiple trays um, and they'll need plenty of light. So you'll need to plan to have um, some kind of a table or a shelf um, set aside in your house for a few months. So what is the process? Um, if you remember all the way back to the skills part one video in April, I talk about the basics of sowing and the way seeds sprout and everything. So I won't go too much into that. You can check back to that video for a refresher. And then um, for indoors specifically, um, there are two main methods to choose from. There is a one-step process where you plant your seeds into individual containers and then you just transplant them out into the garden where they're, when they're ready. Or there's also a two-step process. With this method, you sow all of your seeds together and then a couple weeks later, you move them individually into larger containers. And this two-step process is what we used in um, the greenhouse in the spring. Although, unfortunately, you had to miss the second step. Um, you only got to do the first step where you sowed all of your seeds into one big tray. 
Um, I call these trays community flats because you can start a bunch of different seeds all together. It's just a big shallow tray filled with potting soil with some drainage holes at the bottom. So you filled those and then there was a little behind the scenes magic and your plants arrived to you in uh, individual four and six packs. Um, those plastic trays with the individual cups or cells for each plant. So what we did and what you would have done if not for COVID um, is pull apart each of your sprouts in the community flat and then plant them individually into those four and six packs. And this step is often called potting up. Um, it's not 100% necessary to do this two-step process, um, but there are a few reasons why it's common to do it this way. Um, some reasons why you would want to start your seeds in community flats and then pot them up. Um, the main reason is that it saves space and potting soil. You start plenty of seeds and you see what comes up and then you transfer only the best ones into the cell trays, um, which take up more space and soil. When you start seeds in four and six packs, um, you may have some duds, uh, some weaker ones. So you might have three trays of seeds sitting out, but only like one tray's worth of really good plants. Um, it can also be quicker and easier to just sprinkle out a bunch of seeds um, in a line than to try and count two or three seeds into every individual cell. Um, and it can toughen up your plants a little bit. Um, the potting up and um, transplant process is a little bit stressful for them, but they will grow stronger because of it, um, so that could be a benefit. However, there are some reasons why you would want to start your seeds in individual cells. Um, with the two-step process, since you do have to pull your seedlings out of the soil, um, you need to handle them very gently when you do that, and that can be difficult for some people, um, especially with smaller seedlings like lettuce. So if you skip that step, then you don't have to worry about hurting them. Um, you also have to put in a little more work up front when you sow your seeds individually, but overall it can save a little bit of time by skipping that potting up step. Um, it also makes more sense to sow your seeds individually if you're only starting a few seeds. Um, a community flat can hold a really surprising number of seeds, like hundreds. Um, so if you only want to start five tomato plants and five pepper plants and nothing else, it's probably easier to just put them in their individual containers. So you can use either or both of these methods. Um, it's up to you. You can mix and match. Um, and then there are uh, different types of containers that you might want to use. There's really nothing special that you need to use, just whatever gets the job done. Um, if you want to use the same black plastic trays that we used this spring, um, both, both the community flat trays and the four and six packs, Sprouting Hope has plenty um, and we can give them to you for free. They're used, um, so you'll need to wash them out, but we do have a lot. Um, trays can be reused year after year as long as they hold up, um, but it is possible to have issues like algae or fungus transfer into your next crop. So it's always a good idea to wash out any used containers and then just let them sit in the sun for a while before you start your next round of seeds. Um, also, if you still have the carrying trays with the bigger um, grids and holes at the bottom, those can also be used as seed starting trays if you just um, line them with newspaper to keep the potting soil in. Disposable plastic drink cups um, can actually be a really great alternative to four and six packs and you can reuse those for multiple years too. Um, just make sure you drill enough holes in the bottom that um, the water can get out. If you want to plant something small like lettuce you could use a little bathroom cup and if you want to plant a big tomato you could use a quart size like yogurt container or something even bigger as long as you have um, plenty of holes at the bottom. No matter what container you use, um, it must have very good drainage because if your plants sit in water for too long, they will die. So no matter the container, make sure that the water can get out. You may also be interested in biodegradable paper pots or peat pots where you plant the entire pot in the ground. Um, these are fine if it's what you would prefer, especially if you do want to try transplanting those cucurbits because they won't um, get disturbed but the pots may not decompose fast enough for your roots to get through when they want, and you could end up slowing down your plant's growth, and um, obviously they also can't be reused, so you would have to buy them every year. 
Some people use egg cartons instead of peat pots, um, but each cell is very small and the cardboard is even thicker than the paper pots, so it's not the greatest option, but it's still doable if that's um, what you really want to use. You may have also seen these little jiffy pellets. Um, they're discs that you soak in water and then they expand into these little pods that you plant your seeds into. Um, it's pretty fun and cool, um, but there's no real benefit to using these over anything else. Um, you can use them if you want to, but you may need to add some fertility because it's pretty much just peat moss and you will need to peel off that mesh layer on the outside when you transplant into the garden or else um, your roots will be tangled up forever. Um, paper containers and jiffy pots also dry out faster than plastic containers, so you may need to water them uh, more often. Some containers, like jiffy containers, um, come with a clear plastic lid to put on top of your seedlings, like a little mini greenhouse, and this can be helpful if your house is really cold or dry, um, but it's more likely that it'll end up being too hot and too humid inside of there, and you could end up causing yourself problems. So if you want to use one, um, I recommend using it just until your seeds have germinated and then taking it off. And as much as possible, um, try to match your pot size to your plant size. Um, so crops that will grow larger are in larger pots and vice versa. Um, obviously you don't want your big tomato plant getting cramped and running out of nutrients in a tiny little cell. But on the other hand, if you plant a tiny little lettuce seedling in a big quart sized container and then you try to pull it out to transplant it in your garden, it won't have that nice little root ball and you'll end up breaking um, a lot of the roots. You don't have to go to extremes with this and match them all perfectly, but it's just good to have a couple of different size options if you can. You will also need potting soil for starting seedlings. Um, the material that you grow your seeds in needs to be light and fluffy so that the roots can grow through it easily. Uh, it needs to hold on to water well so that your trays don't dry out too quickly, but it also has to have good drainage so that water doesn't sit in them for too long. It is not a good idea to take soil from your garden um, because it's very heavy and rocky, which makes it more difficult for the seeds and for you. Um, plus, it probably also has a lot of weed seeds. Um, it may have diseases, fungus, and definitely has lots of hungry insects in there. So if you can help it, use potting soil. You can buy potting soil pre-made in bags, or you can mix your own blend. If you buy pre-made, it's important to know um, that even though everybody calls it potting soil, it's technically a potting mix um, because there's no actual soil in it. So if the word soil is on the bag, like if it says garden soil, that is not what you want. Um, and you can get a general mix. You don't need to bother with any kind of special indoor blend or moisture regulation or anything like that. You can just get the basic one. Um, but be sure that you know whether or not it has any fertilizer in it um, and how much. Because, you know, nutrients are good to have, of course, um, but if there's fertilizer added, then you definitely don't want to add any more fertilizer to your plants until they're out in the garden or it could end up poisoning them. Um, if you would prefer to make your own potting soil, um, it's pretty easy. Um, you can use any of these main ingredients. Um, the typical ingredients uh, for pre-made potting soil, a lot of it includes um, ground up tree bark, but that's not really typical to add to your own potting soil. Um, the main ingredient is peat moss. Um, this is a pretty significant ingredient. Um, you may find it called sphagnum peat. Um, it looks like brown little fibers. Basically it's ancient moss um, that has been dug up from peat bogs and it really helps with um, both fluffiness, having that light soil, and with holding on to moisture. Um, it is really important to note that peat moss is sold completely dried out and when it's dry it actually resists holding on to water. When it's wet it's great at holding on to water but when it's dry it really doesn't want to. So. Whether you use peat moss or a potting mix that includes peat moss, um, you have to mix it with lots of water before you use it 
or else it'll never absorb enough water later on and your plants will really suffer. Cocoa core or cocoa peat um, is a more sustainable alternative to peat moss, um, so you might see that as well. It's made up of shredded coconut shells um, and it's just a little better for the environment. Um, compost is another very important ingredient if you're making your own potting soil. Um, it could just be peat moss and compost if you want. Uh, compost has the same benefits that it does in the garden. It's filled with nutrients and it also helps with holding just the right amount of moisture. You want to use a really nice, lightweight, high quality, fully finished compost um, for potting soil. So this may be a time when you want to buy compost instead of using your own, especially if you use the cold or passive method for your own compost. Um, you really want heat treated compost that won't have any weed seeds, insect eggs, any kind of fungus disease, anything like that. And if your compost has chunks in it, um, like little sticks, little pieces of bark, you want to sift those out because just a, a little twig is like a giant log in the way of a seedling um, stuck in a cell. So uh, make sure you do that. Worm castings. Um, if you remember from the compost video, worm castings are just worm poop, um, which is super rich in organic matter and nutrients. It's like a concentrated version of compost, um, which is perfect if you want to add some kind of fertilizer to your potting mix um, because it's gentle enough that it's not likely to injure your plants. Perlite is those uh, little white foamy pebbles that you usually see in potting soil. Um, they're actually volcanic rocks and they help with drainage. They're good to have, they're not 100% necessary. And uh, vermiculite, a lot of you used this when we started the seeds at the greenhouse. It kind of looks like uh, gold flakes or little accordions and it's another mineral. Um, at the greenhouse we used it for covering very small seeds like lettuce um, just sprinkled on the top and vermiculite helps with holding moisture. So you can use it for sprinkling on top or you can mix it into your potting soil but again it's not totally essential. Um, so basically if you want to make your own you just start with some pre-moistened peat moss Add a few scoops of compost and then a little handful of any of the optional ingredients and then you stir it really 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 well because each cell will only have a tiny bit in it so you got to make sure that it's all mixed and then there's a little bit of controversy on whether or not it's okay to reuse potting soil multiple times it's not the best idea um, because most nutrients will be gone, um, so you'll need to add compost or fertilizers the next time anyway, and it can definitely hold on to diseases or insect eggs and give them to your next crop. Some people do it with no problem, but if you are able to, um, I do recommend that you start fresh every time. All right, so now you're ready to sow your seeds. Um, you start by pre-moistening your potting soil um, and then you fill your trays, um, whether you're using a community flat or individual containers. Um, you fill the trays all the way to the top with potting soil. Um, having it full all the way gives your plants more material for their roots to grow through and more nutrients to absorb. It also prevents there being a swampy environment um, down below the edge of the tray between the tray and the soil. Um, especially with individual cells um, because that is a perfect environment for algae and fungus gnats which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, so you fill them all the way up to the top. Um, you can tap it on the table to make sure everything's settled down. Give it a little bit of press. Um, add more if you need to to make sure that they're all the way full because even when they're all the way full the water will settle it um, down a little bit more. Then you just plant your seeds the same way that you would out in the garden. Um, so if you're using a community flat, you can sow them in lines like we did at the greenhouse, or you could space them out in a grid if you want to give them each a little bit more space. And then for individual cells, um, you just put two to four seeds in each cell. And um, remember the method that I showed you at the greenhouse where you just fold up an index card or a piece of paper and then you use a pencil to slide the seeds down the crease. Um, this can be really helpful for controlling small seeds and um, making sure you get the right number. 
and don't sew too much. Um, it will look like a tiny amount of space, like you hardly sewed anything, especially in a community flat. Um, but keep track of how many seeds you're planting or else you'll have a lot more than you know what to do with. And of course, um, be sure to label everything well. It can be really hard to recognize small seedlings and impossible to tell apart different varieties. So label everything with their variety and the date they were planted, um, which you'll need to know um, for when you pot up and everything. And then it's time to water. Watering your seedlings is extremely important um, because like I mentioned, little trays and little cells are a much smaller environment than out in the garden. So each little container of soil will dry out very quickly. Um, however, it is also very easy to overwater your seedlings and end up drowning them. If the soil is always wet, you will get fungus issues and root rot. So you have to let the soil cycle between wet and dry. And when to water will depend on what stage your seedling is in. Soil will typically dry from the top to the bottom and you never want it to dry out all the way down to the bottom. For more mature plants, um, their roots reach all the way down, so you can wait until the soil is dry about halfway down. Younger seedlings have shorter roots, um, so for them you should water once it's dry about a third of the way down, and seeds really only have access to water near the surface, so they should be watered as soon as the surface is dry. To check the moisture level, um, you can stick your finger in or a chopstick, um, or you can just get used to feeling how heavy it is when it's time to water um, because the tray is much, much lighter when it's all the way dry. Um, you should be checking your trays at least once a day. Um, you may not need to water them every day, but it will be pretty often. If they're in a really hot and sunny spot, sometimes it might even be twice a day. So you can water either from the top or from the bottom. Um, watering from the top, like from a watering can, is easy, it works well, um, but it can be messy indoors, like if your tray doesn't fit in your sink. Um, it could disturb your seedlings also if it's um, not a gentle enough spray. So to water from the bottom, um, you fill a container with just a little bit of water, and then you set your trays inside, and then they'll soak up the water like a sponge. Um, it should take somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes or so for the water to reach the top of the soil and then you take the trays out and you let them drain really well. It's very important that you don't leave them soaking for too long because that's the perfect environment for root rot and fungal issues. If it's taking too long, um, you may want to water from the top to get the surface too. So then where do you keep these trays? Um, the warmer the better, so try to keep them around 70 degrees um, if possible. Your seedlings will also need as much light as possible, so a south-facing windowsill is best if you can. Um, if your plants aren't getting enough light, they'll usually let you know by growing leggy, which means that they're tall and spindly and they have long stems but not a lot of leaves, and they may even be bending towards the light. This isn't a death sentence for your seedlings, but it is a sign that they're weak and not growing properly. If you don't have enough sunlight for your seedlings, you might want to consider a grow light, um, which is just a really bright bulb that can imitate sunlight. The bulb should be at least 2,000 lumens and at least 4,000 Kelvin. And you can use a single bulb if you just have a few seedlings, or you can use a long tube light if you have more. And the light should be hanging just a few inches above your seedlings, and you should rotate your trays to make sure they all get equal light. The light should be on for about 16 hours a day, so depending on your schedule, you can probably just turn it on when you wake up and turn it off when you go to bed, or you could use a timer. Setting up a light is not nearly as expensive or as complicated as it sounds, um, but if you don't want to go to the trouble, it is okay for your plants to get a little bit leggy. Um, just do your best. And then you want to make sure you prevent any problems with the soil. The main issues that your seedlings can get are algae, fungus gnats, and damping off fungus. These all happen when the soil is too wet, um, which is why you have to let the surface dry and make sure that your containers have really good drainage, there's no standing water anywhere, anything like that. Um, algae is usually green, it forms on the surface of damp soil, um, especially if those containers aren't full to the top 
and there is that little pocket of warm, still air that I mentioned. Algae itself doesn't really hurt your plants much, um, but it makes a perfect home for fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are the most common uh, pest of indoor plants. They're tiny little gnats that you might find on the surface of your soil or sometimes on the leaves. Um, usually they'll come in through unpasteurized potting soil. Um, fungus gnats mostly eat decaying organic matter, but if there are too many of them, their larvae will begin eating your plant's roots and cause them to rot and eventually die. One simple thing that you can do to break up this cycle other than making sure the soil isn't too wet, um, is to just scratch up the whole surface of the soil every so often. Um, you can use your finger or a little tool um, and just stir it all up to disturb any algae growth, any gnat eggs, anything like that. You can also set up a fan near your seedlings um, because algae and fungus don't grow as well when there's lots of good airflow. Damping off fungus is the other very common problem. Um, the fungus itself can be caused by different fungi like Fusarium or Pythium, but the result is that your seedling stems will shrivel up right at the soil level and eventually fall over and die. Sometimes the seedling will wither up slowly and sometimes it'll just keel right over. Um, unfortunately, there is really nothing you can do to stop damping, fungi damping off fungus once you have it. Um, you just have to start over. So. You really want to avoid that if possible. It also tends to come from infected potting soil and it also grows when the soil is too wet. So if you find issues with fungus gnats or damping off fungus, anything that you suspect is coming from the soil, definitely do not reuse your potting soil and clean your containers very thoroughly before using them again or you'll just have the same problems again next time. All right, so you sow your seeds, you let them grow for a couple of weeks, and then if you're using the two-step method, it will be time for potting up your seedlings in their individual containers. Um, but first, this is where I tell you that the one-step method isn't technically one step. Um, once your seedlings have come up, you do have to thin them out just like you do in the garden um, because you planted more than one in each container. It's really quick and easy, um, but it is important that you don't forget this step. So you can either just um, pinch off the weaker sprouts at ground level till you just have one in each cell. Um, or if you have two that both look really good, um, you can use this potting up method to split them up and try to save both of them. Um, your seedlings will be ready uh, to be potted up when they have at least one, if not two sets of true leaves. Um, remember the seed leaves, the cotyledons are the first two leaves, the ones that come up as the sprout. And usually these look different from the adult leaves. Um, so once enough of your seedlings have some really nice looking true leaves, um, try taking one out of the soil to see how um, developed the roots are. They should be long and have a nice branching pattern. Um, if it's just a couple of spindly little threads, it's too early and they probably won't survive being moved. Some plants are ready as soon as two weeks after sowing, but some take more like four weeks to be ready to um, pot up, so just be patient with them. Um, when you're ready, you fill up your containers just like for sowing. Remember to re uh, pre-moisten your potting soil. Um, this uh, pre-moistening step is really helpful for potting up because if you get the right moisture level, um, you'll make things much easier on yourself. So you want the soil to be just moist enough um, that when you poke your finger into the soil, the hole stays there. Um, if it's too wet or it's too dry and it'll fill back in, it'll be harder to um, put a little plant into the hole. So you want it to be just moist enough that the hole stays. And then it's time to pull your little seedlings out of the soil. Um, they are very fragile, so you have to do this gently. Um, scoop all the way down to the bottom of the tray and pick up all of the soil and a chunk of plants. Um, you can use your hands or a tool like a fork or a spoon. Um, and depending on how closely you planted your seeds and how developed the roots are, it may be easy or it may be difficult to detangle all of the individual plants from each other. Um, if it's difficult, you can try um, dropping the chunk of uh, soil on the table from maybe six inches to try and get some of that loose soil off so you just have the roots to work with. 
Then you work slowly and you pull each individual seedling away from the rest. And um, hold them by the seed leaf if possible um, or by the true leaf. Um, you can pull by the roots a little bit to get them started if you need to, but just never hold your seedlings by the stem. Um, the stem can get bruised and crushed very easily and the seedling will not recover from that. Um, a few roots as you pull um, will break, that's fine, um, but try to pull slowly and gently enough that the roots are sliding apart and you're not ripping them. You'll have to go really slow. Um, so then once you have one seedling, you're still holding it by the leaf, and then you make a hole with your finger in the new container, and um, if the roots are long, I make a hole all the way down to the bottom of the container, and then you gently lower your seedling in and you guide the roots down with your finger or with a chopstick if you need to. You want to make sure that the roots are not pointing upward and they're definitely not poking out of the soil. Um, if you find it difficult to do this process, um, you could try filling your containers only about halfway with soil before you put the plant in and then adding the rest. Um, that's That works for some people. Um, and you want to make sure that you plant the seedling down deeper than it was before, so bury part of the stem. Um, remember, some plants, like tomatoes, really appreciate this and it makes them grow better, but for all plants, it just makes them more stable and they won't fall over. Um, so depending on the plant, um, you may only be able to bury it a little bit extra or maybe a lot, um, but just make sure that the stem has extra support and it's planted down deep. Um, Pretty much as low as you can go um, without the leaves um, getting on the soil or uh, anything falling in. Then you water them and then just like transplanting out in the garden, um, your plants will probably be stressed out for a day or two afterwards. This is normal, just try to keep them away from extreme temperatures, really strong sunlight, things like that um, while they recover. Fertility. Um, you probably won't need to add any fertilizers to your seedlings as they grow. You should be using a potting soil that has some kind of nutrients in it and you can add a little compost or a little bit of worm castings um, to it for a boost. Remember that seedlings are very tiny so they barely need anything in the way of fertility. If they're struggling to grow, it's a lot more likely that it's because of issues with temperature or water or sunlight, um, just about anything else, it's not likely that it's because of nutrients. But if you have identified signs of nutrient deficiency um, and you're sure that it's coming from the soil and not from old seeds or anything like that, um, you can use just a tiny bit of fertilizer, um, less than a quarter of what you would use in the garden um, because there's so little soil in each cell and there's really nowhere for it to go. And stick to liquid fertilizers um, that you can dilute to a very, very weak strength. Um, something like you know, miracle Grow granules um, can easily damage or kill tiny seedlings. And um, too much fertilizer will also encourage fungus gnats. One case where you may want to add fertilizer um, is if your plants are stuck in their containers for too long. Um, maybe they're busting out of their cells but the garden is still too muddy or something like that, um, then a little bit of compost tea or worm casting tea should be enough. Um, make sure that you dilute it well because you want to give them just enough nutrition to make it through, um, not so much that they try and grow a whole lot bigger. All right, so that is it for seed starting. Um, it's really not complicated. It's a lot of steps right here, but once you get the hang of it, it's so simple. It will take you almost no time and it it really makes things easier in the spring if you've got your plants all set to go whenever you're ready for them. So now you've got that. And then I just want to share a few resources um, with you. Um, you know, the program has come to a close now, um, but I want to make sure that you have everything you need going forward um, to make sure that you're going to be successful gardeners for many years to come. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say that you can still reach out to me with questions. Um, don't hesitate because you think a question is too small or too silly. Um, just you know, send me a text or an email or whatever because I do want to help 
Um, you can also reach out to Spreading Hope for assistance, especially during the growing season. And you can go out to the garden for help too. If you want to go back through all of the homegrown classes for information, remember that all of these videos have timestamps um, down below in the description. So you can skip to a specific topic and all of the slides are available for you as well. And I know that I've already mentioned um, the Virginia Tech Extension Office and Wolf Farm Natural Elements a million times, um, but those are really, really great banks of a lot of good information and they're always happy to help you if you reach out to them with questions. Um, beyond those, there's tons of information on the internet to help you. Um, seed company websites tend to be really good resources, especially if you have questions about specific crops, like when to plant or how to harvest, how to store them. Um, Johnny Seeds and Seed Savers Exchange both have pretty detailed grower guides for individual crops. Facebook groups um, can be helpful if you're active on there. Um, you can ask questions of the Washington County Master Gardeners or the Virginia Tech Entomology page if you have questions about a bug. Um, or there are tons of online forums where people from all over come to talk about gardening. Um, I will say that when you get advice from someone who isn't a professional, it's good to double check it um, with another resource because people do make mistakes. Um, there are also YouTube videos on every topic if you want to see something demonstrated and gardening and homesteading blogs and websites um, have tutorials and articles and everything. Um, as you look through those you'll see that everyone has a different method that they like to use and some work better than others for different people so be prepared to try a few different things and see what works for you. Don't be afraid to experiment. Uh, don't be afraid to fail. It's all a part of the process of becoming a successful gardener. Um, just make sure that you use all the resources that are available to you, ask questions, um, and just keep trying. Don't give up. Okay, so for final housekeeping, I do need everyone's end of the year self-evaluation so that we can measure how much you all learned. And a few of you still haven't sent me your blog post yet, so I will need that too. It just needs to be a paragraph or two about your experience this year with a few photos of your garden. All right, so that's it for me. Um, I have really enjoyed working with all of you this season. It has been so exciting to watch all of you get your gardens going and watch you harvest the fruits of your labor. Um, you've all worked so hard and I'm very proud of you. Um, so congratulations for making it through this year. Um, you've accomplished a lot. I know this year wasn't exactly ideal. Um, it wasn't quite what any of us were expecting, but I really appreciate everyone's flexibility and good attitudes this year. And please keep in touch. Um, I would love to know how things are going for you and how your gardens develop in the future. All right, um, thanks again to Americans Helping Americans for making this program possible, and thanks to all of you for being a part of it.